Welcome back to the Expanded Minds Podcast. Today, I got a special guest with me, and his name is Oryx Cohen. Oryx is the Chief Operating Officer of the National Empowerment Center, which is one of three national peer-run technical assistance centers in mental health. He is also the co-producer of the movie Healing Voices, which offers a critical look at the mental health care system. Oryx is also responsible for organizing the National Alternatives Conference every three years and assists states that have underdeveloped consumer slash survivor voices to find that voice and then work towards transforming their mental health systems to become a peer driven and recovery oriented. So Oryx, glad to have you on. And uh, <laughs> and so how are you doing today? Thanks for having me Ezekiel. Yeah. All right. So for like, for people who don't know who you are, can you give a quick timeline of your life and how you got started with, you know, the National Empowerment Center? Sure. I grew up in Oregon. And um, when I was very young, my parents got divorced, um, which I think had a big impact on me um, and kind of led to future issues that I had in my life. Um, But yeah, when you're a kid, you don't um, necessarily dream of working in mental health. Um, I, I, I had other, other aspirations, you know, at a young age. Um, but then I ended up having my own, um, experiences, my own mental health issues and altered states, uh, when I was, um, younger, um, it started with, um, some pretty, I guess you would call it depression, pretty, pretty severe depression. Um, when I was living in Oregon, um, which I was able to get through that, okay. Um, and then I had some other um, experiences with more expanded states, if you want to call them that. Um, when I was 26, that started um, after I moved out to Massachusetts. Um and that's where I really got involved with mental health because I got locked up in a inpatient psych ward um, at that age. And that was really eye opening. Um, but that also inspired me to um, want to do work in this field. And that's how, that's how I got started. Um, the patients were, I was, at first I was afraid of the other patients because of all the things you hear about, um, you know, crazy people and stuff like that. But I really bonded with the patients there and um, I was just inspired at that point to try to maybe create some alternatives that um, were a bit more helpful than being locked, locked up and um, diagnosed and drugged and lots of other things that go on in those facilities like um, isolation and seclusion and restraint and things like that that actually can be traumatizing to people Um, and that whole experience was pretty traumatizing to me Um, so that's that's kind of got what got me started and Then um, I got a job out in Massachusetts that was involved with mental health. And I also um, got to meet a guy named Will Hall. And he now has a a show called Madness Radio, by the way, which is awesome. But Yeah, I I watched the episode he sent me. I mean, (laughs) you you guys talking together, that was a very good conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we met each other and we started an organization called the Freedom Center in Massachusetts, um, which is really independent, no government funding. Uh, we did a lot of great things. We met to support each other uh, at basically almost every week. And we had yoga, we had acupuncture, we had a radio show. Um, we did all kinds of speaking stuff. We did actions, but and that was completely basically a vol- volunteer organization. 
Um, and then that experience led to me getting a job um, starting a place that was actually funded, a peer-run organization called the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community. It's now called the Wildflower Alliance. Um, so I was involved with getting that organization started and I was hired as one of the first co-directors of that organization, um, which actually did a lot of similar stuff to what the Freedom Center was doing, but could do it at a, at a bigger scale because of funding. And then, I, so I worked for them for like four or five years. And then, um, then the job came open at the National Empowerment Center. Um, and I applied for that and I was able to get that job. Um, so I started with managing the, we have a big grant, a big federal grant. Um, and we're a national um, peer run mental health organization, which is kind of cool that our government funds those types of organizations. You mentioned that there are three, there's actually now five that are funded by the government. Um, so I started out managing the grant and, um, and then I, I got uh, kind of promoted to chief operating officer. And then um, recently one of the founders and the C longtime CEO, Dan Fisher retired so I have been, it's been almost a year, it'll be a year in April, a year next month um, that I've taken over as the CEO. So that's the long kind of history of how I've ended up from um, psych wards to be a CEO of a national organization. <laughs> I'm not fired yet, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. One thing that was like pretty, so looking at your story, one thing that I was very interested in is your, when like it was like around 1999 is when you first had like your first manic episode where you mm -hmm. thought you can fly your car driving mm -hmm. on the street or freeway or something like that. So like, but before that you had mentioned how you felt like a lot of the limits on your mind started to break. So you had moved from Oregon to Massachusetts and then that whole experience was very emotionally uh, intense for you. And so during that process, you started to feel more heightened sense of like, you know, feeling like you can do whatever you want, more confidence, things like that. And then you started your own, you started like becoming a philosopher and things like that. So can you, can you talk about what led up to your first mania episode and what led you up in the, in the psych mm. system? Like how, yeah. and how was that experience spiritual in a sense? When I was, I mentioned that I got really down and depressed and there were some things going on with work and a girlfriend out in Oregon um, that kind of brought me really, really down. So I had that experience. And before that, it was just kind of, I don't know. I was sick. I think I was down for a while, like not even through high school. Um, just not feeling good about myself or confident. Um, so really struggling with, with self image and self esteem, that kind of thing. Um, didn't have a lot of friends, um, like painfully shy <laughs> in terms of speaking. So it's kind of weird that I'm doing this now, but, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of the way I was. And then it got really bad when I was, you know, kind of really depressed. I was able to get through that through exercise and like eating good. And, and I just needed a change from Oregon. So that the whole move from Oregon to Massachusetts was helpful to get me out of that really depressed state. Um, and and start, starting something new, starting graduate school. So when I got to grad school, started meeting these new people. And when you move somewhere, it's like a almost an opportunity to redefine yourself. So you're not, you know, you're around different people. They don't necessarily have certain presumptions about you and who you are. And you can develop patterns around the people that you 
normally hang out with and that can shape kind of who you are because I think in a lot of ways we're like mirrors for each other so anyways I was I felt like I was finally like cool (laughs) 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 I never never had that experience before really so yeah I was you know hanging making new friends who are also starting grad school and going out a lot staying out late so when I say like I think it was a positive in terms of expanding my mind yeah I was starting to feel really good uh and I think a lot of ways being you know feeling really down can kind of limit your 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 potential your um you know what you're capable of and so I was having like all these realizations and you know epiphanies I call them epiphanies and, and were they all coming in at once or is it like a or um, did it slowly start to come to you these epiphanies it was a span of like a week so it wasn't it was pretty rapid um that I was going through all this and you know I think a big problem that young people have is this is not an uncommon experience (laughs) um but in our culture we don't know how to guide people we don't we we tell them oh this is a sign of an illness and something to be scared about and then what happens is yeah yeah then it is then it becomes scary because we treat it as such but it but it was an amazing experience and if i had someone if i had like a spiritual guide to help me through it i think it could have gone a lot different. Um, yeah, because I was just, most of it was, at the at least at the beginning, it was a beautiful experience, like feeling really connected with everything and everybody and, um, you know, having these realizations that we're, we're all connected as humans and we're more than we're connected to everything. We're connected to the desk and the, walls and you know, yeah. um, everything where yeah was, and and just be feeling that just it's hard to describe when you ask about spiritual experience um because it's so much deeper than language really um but that those were some of the things that i was going through and i um i had like a kundalini experience where all like rush to my head and i could feel that very powerful um vibrations going on um but had no idea what was going on (laughs) (laughs) because we're not i wasn't educated in um in any of this kind of stuff so um what i think what happened for me is what happens to a lot of young people is they think oh i'm I'm just really special. That's why this is happening to me. And then you get young people thinking they're Jesus and all this stuff when it's kind of a more of a natural um, spiritual development process that they're going through. Um, Yeah. So that definitely happened to me. I thought, oh, you know, I'm you need to listen to me because I've got stuff figured out and <laughs> I started preaching a lot. And, you know, and people are like, what's going on? This guy came in here. He's a quiet guy. And I just like, you want to, you want to <laughs> that's interesting because, um, I think we talked about a little bit about it, like, uh, in San Diego, but like one of the things I had mentioned was like how I, would, I was getting these intense headaches and I, was, I checked into like the doctor because I was like, okay, I'm having these intense migraines. And this is like around 2019. So I just recently quit, you know, medication and things like that. And I was having these intense headaches and I was like going to the doctor because I was like, I'm probably, probably having intense migraines or maybe, maybe I can get on some quick painkillers because I couldn't take the, the amount of pain that was like in my head. And what was interesting though, is that behind the scenes and the experiences that I was getting was I would have these crazy out of body experiences where like how you mentioned, like you said, energy would shoot up into your head and then, uh, you know, Kundalini awakening or whatever, like energy would shoot up into my head. Like during the nighttime, I would have these rushes of energy into my head. And then sometimes I'll pop out of my body. 
So like the energy would just build up in my head. And then also, I was, like literally I could hear the popping sound. I was like, and I'd come out of, I'd just launch out and I'd see, I don't even remember what I saw most of the time. I just remember the process just kept happening over and over again. So I really, I remember how the process happened, but I just don't remember some of the stuff I saw. But, and so at what point though for you, did you, did it become uncontrollable for you? Or was it more of like, a, you had everything under control, but people started to think that you were going crazy? Like at what point did it, did it start coming under a stigma or label that what you're going through was something that could be, you know, harmful or dangerous to people? Or- Yeah, yeah. So these were, these, these are, um, you know, people I, I didn't know um, previously. So um, they, they were, a lot of people got concerned that I was, you know, talking a mile a minute and this kind of stuff. So they, they, it was the um, student, like the students that recommended I go see a psychologist um, on campus. So I did that and I, I kind of like talk circles around him. <laughs> um, so he, he, he was probably like, man, this guy's whoa. And, and, <laughs> and in my mind, I was like, this guy doesn't know anything. So, and I'm just like, and, and, and I probably, and I wasn't like the kindest, you know, in that, especially when people are like judging me and I could tell what was kind of going on is um, people were up, were scared and they were worried and they were saying there was something wrong with me. So um, that definitely had an impact on me. And I think it would have been different if people approached it as, oh, wow, you're having this amazing experience. And this, this, is, these are ways that you can channel this and, um, but I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have that piece of it. It was just like, there's something wrong. There's something, yeah, you need, you need to get help. Um, and I didn't, I didn't want that. So um, that kind of, I think that led me to say, well, maybe I don't need, need to be in this program. Um, just the way that people were responding to me. So I um, decided that I was going to write a book about my experience and go um, to my grandpa's house, which was like an hour drive, hour and a half. Um, and so I had my mind made up that that's what I was going to do. And I got in the car and was just le leaving going to leave school. And that's when these out of control um, experiences happened. Um, so yeah, that, that was the car ride where I, I convinced myself I could fly my car to go visit my uh, ex-girlfriend in Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, yeah, found out that you can't do that on physical reality. Oh, you can't do that? <laughs> um, but I also had some other really wild experiences um, when I was going through the state uh, before that. Um, are you talking visions or what, what do you? Oh, um, well, the visions, the visions were more, I would say, right right during that car ride like i i had some intense stuff going on the vi more visions and things like that um what were you gonna mention before that oh um but then i had two other states where i had all kinds of st uh, visions <laughs> so i think i was i was going to the bookstore to try to return my books or because i was leaving um the college and um and then I was, I think I was talking a lot <laughs> in the bookstore and when people were looking at me like, oh, and then, and then, um, and then I, so I was talking a mile a minute and they were like, I, all these people were looking at me 
while I was talking. I don't, I don't remember exactly what I was talking about. Some some deep, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> about how we're all connected and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so everybody's like staring at me. And then, and then I made a joke about how I can hypnotize people. And, and cause they were like looking at me like, <laughs> <laughs> and when I made that joke, then they like snapped out of it. And I was like, Oh, well I can unhypnotize people too. <laughs> um, so I remember that was a powerful thing. Just like, Oh man, I can, I can, that's the way I interpret it in that moment. Like I can, I can hypnotize people. <laughs> and they did seem hypnotized, like looking, you know, staring at me. They're probably thinking, what is this guy doing? I got to keep my eye on him. <laughs> yeah. But um, that was, that was a powerful experience. And I interpreted in that moment as like, I have this power to hypnotize people. Um, and then, yeah, then, kind of led up to the the car ride and um well i've had the power to hypnotize people maybe i have the power to teleport maybe I have the power to you know do this or that um so yeah there was some logic behind it but it was you know an, an altered state not in touch with um physical reality yeah and the our vision is quite interesting. Like, I think when you talk about seeing something or like a picture, maybe a scene play out in front of you that isn't connected to physical reality, I find that very interesting. And it's like, when I was having those experiences where I was having intense headaches, one of the things that happened to me was, um, it was either in meditation or right before I was going to sleep where the energy would just shoot up into my head. And then from my head, there, there's just such an intense pressure point or people say it's like a third eye or whatever, but it's like, I would experience such an intense uh, energy point right here. And from there, then I would see visions. Like I could see stuff starting to project out images and they would just get thrown out of my head and I'd see stuff, just stuff that I can't even describe. Quite interesting. But, right. And so, and when it comes to like people who are, that's kind of what I thought about when it comes to people who are schizophrenic or see stuff that aren't there, is it, is it that they lose control of, like they can't control that mechanism and they just shoot out of their mind? And I think that, or I don't think people have thought about that because when it comes to, you know, that energy rushing through you and things like that, it has to do with you having a soul. And I think that that has to do with you kind of being seated in an unseen place, if that makes sense. So like, in order for you, like, there's a part of you that's pure energy and that receives these visionary experiences. I'll just wear it like that. And then they come to you and then they get projected out. So I think that's a better way to put it. Hmm. And so, and so for you, like have, so when you're having visionary experiences, what was it like for you? And did you kind of experience that intense energy in your head or was it something else? So each time I've gone into one of these really intense states, I've had a seizure. Um, like, I've learned a complex partial seizure. So I actually had one of these seizures while driving the car. So when I, so my head goes back, my eyes roll in the back of my head, my mouth open. And then I come to, and I'm, I'm basically in this, what I experience as a different dimension, altered state, different world. Um, very dangerous to, to be in a car when that happened <laughs> yeah. um because i didn't know what the heck was going on um the first time that it happened um the second time it happened was uh three years later and i had a girlfriend at the time it was right after i graduated um from that from, i went back to that grad school which was a very hard thing to do uh, after, you know, acting very strangely. <laughs> um, but I, I went back to the grad school. I finished my degree um, and, and I met a girl in that program. And so she was my girlfriend um, while I was at school. And then 
um, when I graduated and I got a job that kind of drove me crazy a second time. <laughs> um, I got this job working in a group home to see if I could, to see if the mental health system was as bad as what I experienced <clears throat> and what I was studying. Cause I was able to actually study when I went back, I studied mental health policy. So I got this job at a group home where it was really bad. I mean, these people had been there for years and they were, you know, not living great lives and they were, you know, heavily medicated. And so that I, and then I was just, how do I fix this? Um, and so I would same kind of pattern. I w wasn't sleeping much and not eating well. And, um, and, and then I had this, then I had another seizure where I went into another altered state and, um, this time I didn't go straight to the hospital. I was just experiencing all the, all this, all the visions that you're talking about. And, um, my, the way I describe it is dreaming while awake. So, um, and, and, and they also describe it as spiritual, definitely some spiritual aspect, I think. Because I'll, I'll describe some of it. Like I would be laying in bed, and the and the windows, you know, windows open so you can see the sky um, and the clouds. And it was it wasn't like the clouds were passing by. It was like I was the clouds. It was it was. <laughs> It, it was, I was everything. I was connected. Um, and that was a really beautiful part of the experience. And then like, like you felt energetically connected, like you felt like there's some kind of energetic connection between the cloud or was it like, what is feeling connected? It was just one. It? it was just one. I was, it wasn't, there wasn't a distinction between me and anything around me. It was just like, yeah, I was, we were just one. And um, yeah, so that was, that was an amazing experience. And then the kind of shadow side of these experiences, at least for me, was um, some really intense, difficult visions. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples of things that I experienced. One, one was traveling around the universe in a spaceship and finding a planet that was habitable and um and then uniting with other humans on that planet and <laughs> and then holding hands in a circle and saying miracles can happen so actually it was kind of disturbing and kind of cool at the same time. <laughs> um, that seems pretty cool. Like what's disturbing about it? Was it the part where you're searching for those people or was it? Well, I think the part of the disturbing is the reason that we were doing that was because the earth was destroyed. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, did find, we did find another planet. Um, and, um, and then like another one, was like I was in in Survivor. I was like, you know, in in that show Survivor, and um, all kinds of weird stuff happened there. Um, and then the disturbing, most disturbing one was I had a vision of lemmings that um, that were uh, jumping over a cliff. And like killing themselves, and in my mind, I thought they looked happy to be doing that. Since then, I've oh. come to a new interpretation of that vision. But um, what is, what's your interpretation of it? Uh, now it's well. I had moved from Oregon to Massachusetts, and um, and that was actually a vision I had that first the first time in 1999. So it was. Now I understand that as a meaningful vision because um, lemmings aren't actually trying to kill themselves. Uh, 
because originally I thought, oh, they look happy. That maybe I should try that, and that really scared me. Um, but my interpretation now is that in doing research on lemmings, <laughs> is they have they migrate. They migrate really long distances, and they're not trying to kill themselves, but they a bunch of them do die while they migrate because of you know difficult terrain or whatever they they go on a very long journeys so here i was going on a very long journey um 3000 miles from oregon to massachusetts and um i didn't put it together in the moment <laughs> that maybe this vision had more meaning but um it actually did have a lot of meaning uh i think i was afraid that this trip was going to kill me <laughs> in a way so mm -hmm. and then so you talked about dreaming while awake and and i mean you having seizures and stuff too one thing that i find is like when the energy like surges through you and things like that like you feel a bunch of electricity and your body vibrates very heavily and i can give an example where like this one time i used to be very into you know praying for people and energetic transference things like that so I, this one guy i prayed for him and what happened to him was okay he was very down and feeling very suicidal and things like that and then when i prayed for him he started to feel a burden lift off of him he started to feel a burden lift off of himself and then he started to feel these intense vibrations and then from there i was like i, I kept like praying for him until he felt all the burden leave like all of it lift off of him oh wow and then he got to a point to where then he felt very light and like how you described everything felt hd everything was clear everything was bright whereas beforehand before I'd, before i prayed for him he described everything as being dark and kind of down so everything started to clear up his vision started to be like super clear in hd and then from there then he said he started he said that he saw a light and i said okay like focus on that light and then when he did he entered into a visionary experience and then um, but the steps leading it to, leading to that vision experience though, was he felt very down and weighed down. Then he started to feel the energy course through him. And then those intense vibrations he described, and then the burden, the, the darkness started to lift off of him and stuff like that. So, uh, for, when you experience seizures, do you experience that? Or is that something different? Like you experience uh, intense vibrations beforehand and does it just surge through you or is it like what is it it's the three times that it's happened it's happened i have i wasn't really expecting it to happen um but I, I, I mean a lot led up to it i was pretty stressed out not sleeping um so definitely a lot had to lead up to that experience um but the seizure itself. After the first time, I knew, I knew, uh, I knew, I knew what was going on. I didn't know how to get out of the state necessarily, but I knew that a big seizure like that meant I was an, in another state. Um, not sure how to get out of it. <laughs> um, so there's another myth about "quote unquote" crazy people is <laughs> they don't they don't know what's going on. They they have no self reflection they can't learn anything that wasn't true for me um like for the, the second time i went through it for example i knew i was in that state i didn't know how to get out of it i but i knew i for example i should not drive a car so i you know, made a my, my girlfriend um at the time uh drove me around places while i was going through that um so I was able to go through the experience in a much more safely. Um, and by the way, I'm now married to her. So <laughs> she's been with me through two of these experiences. Um, yeah, we have two kids, house, living, living, a, living a version of the American dream. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about, so I'm going to pull up a bipolar, like one diagnosis. But what I'm curious about is like, how does the mental health uh, system treat somebody like this versus um, some or versus like, what's your ideal way to treat somebody with this diagnosis? So I'm going to pull up like what the, what do you call it? 
With the DSM, definitely. Yeah, the DSM says. So I, that's the DSM chart. And so you know, yeah. people can take a look at it. This is basically what a manic episode is. So how does a med- mental health system treat somebody like this versus like with what you do and things like that? How do you see somebody like this? Right. Diagnosed with these labels. Right. Um, yes. So I'm familiar with the DSM. <laughs> um, and I was diagnosed with bipolar. And this is bipolar one, by the way, bipolar one diagnosis. Yeah, bipolar one. Um, and, uh, but I was a psychology major as an undergrad and this was grad school. I was in grad school. So, I mean, I think one benefit for me was that I rejected the medical model. I rejected the disorders in general. Um, and I kind of saw through it as a human invention, a way of describing human behavior. Um, so I was, I was an annoying um, psych patient that challenged the psychiatrists and challenged the social workers and said, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at these experiences. This is one way to look at the experience, the biological way. But why isn't there a test? Why are you telling me I'm something and not giving me a, why, why are you telling me that I have an illness or a disorder? And with any other disease, there would be some sort of blood test. There'd be some sort of, if you're saying this is a physical, you know, chemical imbalance in my brain, wh- where is the, where's the test? And they could obviously couldn't come up with a test. They just, oh, this guy's, uh, um, you know, being non-compliant difficult mental patient not doesn't have insight into his disorder um so um yeah so as far as the question of how we look at these things i think it's very very important very important and um in our western culture we look at these experiences as pathological as disease as illness um something's wrong um but other cultures don't look at these experiences that way so everything that's listed here you know more talkative um, increased self-esteem or grandiosity um increased energy bizarre behavior all of this stuff um looked at through a different lens then the outcomes can be quite different. So if we look at these experiences as potential spiritual awakening, as um, having deep meaning for individuals rather than being meaningless, um, then the outcomes are again quite different so in cult there are there are cultures where mental illness quote-unquote mental illness doesn't really exist because and a lot of them are indigenous more indigenous cultures where they have shamans and many of the shamans have gone through similar things and it's not seen as an illness it's seen as a gift seen as being in touch with um something real that's out there, you know, spiritual, a spiritual connection. Um, so, so like our, our rituals from those cultures, for example, I think one of them was like bullet hand, like I think one culture does like bullet ants, like put a glove on and stuff. And so it was like inducing intense levels of pain and trauma on somebody a way that they get somebody into these kind of states that you have listed here. And then, yeah. Do they walk them through that kind of experience? They that- walk them through it. They, they say, this is a, important experience you know some cultures call them vision quests that i like to instead of describing this as psychosis or man a manic episode or whatever i my i like to use that term vision quest for my experience i think it fits pretty well unguided it was definitely unguided vision quests (laughs) um but yeah it can be extremely valuable 
Um, and in those cultures that um, do that as a ritual, they actually don't eat, they don't sleep for a few days. They might do something like the bullet dance <laughs> or, uh, some, or peyote or whatever it is that um, induces those states on purpose. Um, and oftentimes these states are the most, those experiences are the most experience, the most important experiences that people have in their lives and they get their names from them. They're named from, for, you know, something they see in their vision. It could be a bear, it could be, um, something to do with the sky and trees or whatever. That's how they get, but that name comes from, they are actually named. Your identity is through your vision quest. Um, and um, so that's quite a different way of handling these experiences and, and understanding these experiences and, look, and, and the way that these cultures look at these experiences. And it's, it's no surprise that a lot of these cultures don't really have an issue with um, with mental, quote unquote, mental illness or dep what is depressed being dep they don't have any clue what depression is. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, a lot of indig indigenous cultures that encounter the Western world uh, and, and have, you know, basically survived attempts at and some and sometimes successful attempts at genocide so severe trauma um they still have these rituals in those communities but they still they have a lot of problems too with mental health and addiction and you can understand why <laughs> if you've been traumatized to that level but if you're i'm talking about indigenous communities that have been relatively like untouched by the Western world, you, you find these, these really amazing outcomes. So then what can you like make clear, like what are the traps within the mental health system that define whether somebody is going to heal and move on from their mental illness versus somebody who's going to uh, stay stuck in it? Because I remember like, for example, like when, you know, I got diagnosed with a major depression and bipolar. I remember the world getting completely shut down. Like, I remember just things just being like, damn, like, I'm going to be stuck like this forever. And so I'm just going to have to cope with this situation. So, like, what lies have you seen that keep people stuck in their diagnosis and kind of in this hopeless state? Um, and then how, how can you see a way out of it and healing past it? Well, I mean, I think, unfortunately, the medical model system is, is designed to create dependency. And it's, de it's designed to have not so great uh, outcomes because if someone doesn't fully heal, then they're going to consume the products. And let's be honest, the product is psych drugs for the most part. Psych uh, the psychiatric drug industry is the most profitable industry in the U.S., the most profitable um, you see drug ads out there for everything. So we have to be honest about where this is coming from. And a lot of it has to do with dollars. Um, it's making a few people very, very rich to, um, to tell people that they're sick and that they need their drug for the rest of their life. Imagine that. More and more people sick, the more people that need your drug the rest of their life, the more money... I make <laughs> so um, that we, we we have to mention that um, because it's it's definitely there. So yeah, the system is is designed to tell people that they're broken and they need they're going to need some sort of support for the rest of their lives. So how do you get out of that? Um, and I'm not saying that the drugs don't help a lot of people because they have helped a lot of people. So it's not as simple. Um, the drugs have helped people since we learned how to, you know, that different um, plants had different things in them that made us feel different ways. And 
you know, we've been, we love, dr- humans love drugs from, from the, you know, very early on. <laughs> so yeah, the drugs can, can help a lot of people. Um, but if when the problem becomes when you package that and you tell people that's the only way to go, that this is a cure for a chemical imbalance, which is a straight out lie, that um, you, it, it's just obvious that it's a, it's a, it's it's about making money. Um, Wait, what so, about it? it? Makes it a lie though. Like when they tell you, like you can get, it's a cure. Like this pill would be a cure. Like is well, it in terms of what it does to your brain, or like what? Yeah, is it? No, there's there's been a ton of research on. Um, chemical imbalance theory and basically that theory has been proven not true um there's no there's no um evidence like for depression or bipolar or schizophrenia any of these diagnoses that there is any sort of you have less of this neurotransmitter you have more of this or that all if, if you look at their research, the research that has been funded by the big organizations, National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Health, um, there have been books published on this. There have been high-level psychiatrists that basically say this theory has been disproven. At this point, it's been disproven. So, um, yeah, there's a ton of evidence to say this is not true. So, um, th- so you hear the the drug ads say Dep- depression may may be caused by a chemical imbalance. That's the way they get around it. May might be maybe. Um, they never say it actually is, um, but that's the power of marketing. That's the power of money, because if you throw out advertisement after advertisement saying something may be a chemical imbalance then people start to believe that it's a chemical imbalance. And if you, and this has actually been done um, by a filmmaker named Daniel Mackler, who'd be a cool interview, by the way. Um, he went to Washington Park in New York City in one of his movies. And he asked just regular people, what do you think mental illness is? You know what they said? 90%, 95 to 100% of them said their first thing, it's a chemical imbalance. Chemical imbalance. It's a chemical imbalance. It's a chemical imbalance. It's a chemical imbalance, and they say mm-hmm. that because that's what they see on TV. <laughs> um, so that that is the belief that these things are chemical imbalances when they're actually not. They're not chemical imbalances. So um, then we get to a more interesting conversation of what they actually are, um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my long answer that the system is designed to keep you there, designed for you to keep consuming the products. Um, so for me to get, I I had to find alternatives. I had to find alternative ways of looking at this experience to, um, to, to stop being a consumer of the mental health system, basically, <laughs> um, to find, to find peer support and holistic alternatives and spirituality, you know, different ways of looking at, at my experience, different interpretation of what I went through. That's, that's what's helped me. I think, or I remember Will Hall, he mentioned how over here on this side, you have like psychoactive drugs, you know, the hallucinogens, things like that. And then, over here, you have like all the the medications that the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical industry will, you know, give you and stuff like that. And then right here, people imagine there's a barrier between these two, but really, he said there's they're actually under the same umbrella and they're both psychoactive. Yeah. And I, th- for me personally, I think that there is a spiritual significance behind drugs in general. I think that when they alter your quote unquote brain chemistry and people yeah, talk about like, it just changed your brain chemistry. I think there's also a spiritual component when your brain chemistry changes. And actually one, like one of the first podcasts I did was me and my friend talking about a story where he did a psychoactive substance and, you know, people will just label that and say, Oh, he's just going through his own 
chemical, like his brain's just hallucinating stuff. His brain is doing this bunch of, is having a chemical reaction with this substance and he's just hallucinating stuff and he's going through this experience and it has nothing to do with, um, it's not spiritual at all. It's just something that's biological. But in, when I was with him though, I could feel his aura. Like I can intuitively feel his like energy just shooting out. Yeah. And so for me, that opened up my mind to where I was just like, this isn't just a no. brain chemical thing. There's something behind that spiritual. Yeah. So maybe there could be some kind of evil behind what these, there can be some kind of evil that can be behind the intentions of these drugs, for example. Maybe they're caused to do harm. Maybe they're caused to do good. But that has to, I mean, obviously that takes further investigation. But I think there's always people forget about the spiritual side of drugs and things like oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a very interesting one because um, there, there's been research on hallucinogenics and uh, and, the, and and you really can't distinguish the um, the experiences that are caused by hallucinogenics versus those of us that have gone through those experiences without the help of drugs. So they're they're very similar. And like I said, you're accessing something very real, spiritual. So it's interesting because um, there's different kind of stigmas about both. Like if 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 I have my experience that's caused by a drug, let's say, then I can say, oh, well, it was it was the drug. I'm I'm not crazy. Like it was it was the drug that made me go through that experience. <laughs> um, but then you have the flip side of that where it's like, well, I actually I took this drug and I had a very real spiritual experiences, but people are saying this isn't real because the drug, you know, I took this drug. So it's all they're saying it's all the drug. So I, there's like multiple sides to that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like, what are some fears around going on psych, like psychiatric drugs and then getting off of them? Like, cause I know I, especially with my personal experience with them, it's kind of, it seems very, at least when I was getting into it, it seemed very risky. Um, and I know for some people, like that's the reason why they hesitate. I know there is situations where people actually need to be on them. And so like, can you kind of break down the fears around it and kind of remove, kind of give like a neutral perspective on, you know, psychiatric drugs on whether people, mm -hmm. what kind of people should be on them? What kind of people shouldn't be on them kind of thing? Yeah. Surprisingly, I can do that. <laughs> be, pretty, <laughs> pretty, be pretty neutral because I am actually pro choice on drugs of all kinds. Um, so like you said, the, they're all under the same umbrella of psychoactive substances. So um, I would say if something is working for you, then do it. Um, you, you know, with any drug, you should know what the risks are involved, um, what potential side effects, um, and um, ultimately, it's people's decision. I've, I've had times in my life where drugs have been helpful um, for me, um, whether that's prescribed or um, otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a, in a lot of respects, a personal choice. Um, then there's the the more controversial areas where people ask on that very kind of low, and I have to emphasize very very low percentage of people where they may be dangerous um, to themselves or other people. That's where people tend to go with this, and I have to say it's a very very small percentage of people. But if you're going to go that go there. Um, when you say when should people be on medication, my 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 opinion is uh, you know more on the I guess abolitionist. That's my personal thing. Like, um, I'd rather see s someone um, kind of physically kept safe, whether that's, uh, you know, temporarily 
you know, in a, in a jail cell or <laughs> something that keeps them safe and keeps other people safe rather than using a chemical substance to try to keep someone safe. Um, but I can definitely see the argument the other way, like, well, you know, if, if they're that out of control, then, um, maybe they need to be sedated. <laughs> um, so I can see that argument. I don't, that's not where I land with it, but, um, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough. These aren't easy conversations. There's no easy answers to them. So, but I will say if you, if we can create communities where people are loved and valued, um, then, um, then these situations are much, much less likely to, to happen. You know, horrible things like school shootings and, you know, violence are, are much, much less likely to happen. It's about what kind of communities are we creating for people to live in? Um, and that's, that's the kind of work that I'm doing, trying to create positive spaces for people. All right, uh, final question. Any last advice for people and where can people find you? Yeah. Um, advice for people is to trust yourself. Um, if something doesn't feel quite right in what you're doing for yourself, then you need to trust that. Um, find what Find what works for you. And um, you are the expert on your own experience. And in order to find us, you can go to www.power2u.org. The number two, the letter U, power2u.org. And my movie, Healing Voices, is available on Amazon Prime. If you just go to Amazon Prime, plug Healing Voices, you will find the, the film. All right. Awesome. Thank you for coming on, Orx. Thanks for having me. This was a great, uh, great talk. Appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate you too.